Hey, my name is Sarah Anderson, and I'm a senior in the exercise science program at Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, my experiential learning site for the fall of 2021 was at Saracen Memorial's cardiopulmonary rehabilitation. So the patients that you will be seeing are either cardiac patients, pulmonary patients, or vascular disease patients. Um, cardiac patients are typically seeing you after a life-changing cardiac event, such as a heart attack or some sort of surgery, such as a heart transplant, stent placement, or coronary artery bypass graft, also referred to as cabbage. Um, to kind of break down these surgeries for you, um, the two most common that you will see within your rehab program are stent placements and cabbage. So a stent placement is a little bit less invasive than cabbage. Um, it's done by the cardiologist placing a um, small plastic tube with a catheter in either the patient's wrist artery or their groin artery. And then they guide this catheter up towards the coronary artery of the heart where the blockage is. Um, within the catheter, there's a balloon that the cardiologist can actually inflate to help um, promote blood flow through the vessel and get rid of the blockage. Um, a patient can have anywhere from one to three stents placed in one surgery, and um, they are typically released and cleared for rehab about one to two weeks post-surgery, and they don't um, typically have any sort of limitations for upper body exercises. So they can come to rehab and pretty much start up right away doing strengthening exercises on the weight machines um, that include like overhead or um, chest press. They can do aerobic exercises that involve their arms, such as we have a new step bike, which works both the arms and the legs, and it's like an alternation of the pedals. Same with the Airdyne bike, which they can use their arms and their legs. So patients who have underwent a stent placement typically don't have any limitations. However, due to the invasiveness of a cabbage procedure, um, since this is an open heart surgery where the cardiologist will actually take a vein from either the patient's lower leg in their calf or their arm and they'll place it above and below the blockage within the coronary artery, creating a whole new vessel. So since this is an invasive open heart procedure, patients are not typically cleared to begin rehab until about four to six weeks post-surgery. And then when they are cleared for rehab, they still have to wait a few more weeks until they can um, engage in upper body exercises. So that includes any sort of aerobic exercise that involves the upper extremities or any sort of strengthening weight training machines that involve the upper body. Okay, so here's a look at our facility. We have tons of aerobic equipment like treadmills, recumbent bikes, upright bikes, new steps, airdyne cycles, ellipticals, arc trainers. And then we also have strengthening equipment like a seated row shown right here, biceps curl, leg extension, leg curl. And then we're going to work our way over to our ab crunch. And then our chest press, shoulder press, triceps press, and our lat pull down. In the cardiac patient's initial evaluation process, the exercise physiologist will meet with them for about an hour and go over important baseline measures such as the patient's height, their weight, their BMI and their body fat percentage, which is assessed using a bioelectrical impedance analysis device. The exercise physiologist will also review the patient's medical history, their medication use, and their best learning style. The exercise physiologist will also work with the patient to go over their current exercise habits, as well as set goals to meet during their time in the program, such as increasing strength and endurance. They will also go over current eating habits and set goals, such as increasing fruit and vegetable intake, eliminating red meat for their diet, etc. The exercise physiologist will also help the patient set psychosocial goals such as improving their quality of life and risk factor goals such as losing weight or improving the heart's ejection fraction. After the patient completes their initial evaluation process, the exercise physiologist will send them home with a packet of surveys that assesses the patient's emotional health, their quality of life, and their nutrition habits. 
The first survey is shown to the left and assesses the patient's emotional health by asking questions that have to do with their sleep habits, their fatigue levels, appetite levels, and how they perceive themselves. The second questionnaire assesses the patient's quality of life by asking things such as their physical fitness levels, their feelings, their pain levels, the amount of social support that they receive at home, how often they engage in social activities, and their overall health. And the final questionnaire assesses the patient's daily eating habits and ask questions such as their fruit and vegetable intake, how often they consume sweets and processed foods, what type of fat that they use in their cooking, their cuts and types of meats, and what dairy products they use. A patient will complete a pre-survey to obtain baseline values after their initial evaluation process, as well as a post-survey right before they are discharged to assess their change in their emotional health, quality of life, and nutrition habits during their time in cardiac rehab. At the end of the cardiac patient's initial evaluation process, the exercise physiologist may choose to perform a graded exercise stress test on the patient to assess their functional capacity and create an exercise prescription that matches their exercise capacity and target heart rate range. To make sure that the patient is safe to begin exercising, the exercise physiologist will take their resting blood pressure, heart rate, and a measure of the heart's electrical activity using a 3-lead EKG monitor. Doing this makes sure that the patient is not experiencing any abnormal heart arrhythmias, such as premature ventricular contractions, or PVCs, atrial fibrillation, or AFib, or bigeminis, which is an abnormal heart rhythm every two beats. The three graded exercise stress tests that we use at our facility are all on the treadmill, and they are the Bruce Protocol Stress Test, the Modified Bruce Protocol Stress Test, and the Naughton Protocol Stress Test. The Modified Bruce Protocol Stress Test and the Naughton Protocol Stress Test are beneficial for individuals and populations with a reduced exercise capacity due to their gradual increase in the speed and incline on the treadmill. On the patient's final cardiac rehab session, so their 36th session, we will give them a piece of paper that has a front and back as shown here on this slide. The front side has recommendations for the patient to follow for exercise once they are discharged from the program to practice at home. So we recommend for them to aerobically exercise on four to six days per week following their target heart rate range or an RPE of 11 to 14 for 30 to 60 minutes at a time. We also recommend strength training two to three non-consecutive days per week and daily stretching. And then we recommend for them to continue to consume a whole food, well-balanced, plant-based diet. And then on the back side of the sheet, we show them how their measurements are from their initial evaluation session to their final discharge session. We compare their initial and final weight, body fat percentage, and their BMI. We also do waist circumference and their MET level, which is measured by how many stages they reach on their exercise stress test. And then based on the surveys that they return to us, we record their diet survey scores, their quality of life, and their health questionnaire results. And then on the bottom of the page, we write down what they were doing in rehab as their exercise prescriptions so that they can follow it once they are discharged and are exercising at home or at a gym. So to measure our patient's body composition measurements, we use a bioelectrical impedance analysis device, which is this. It uses the patient's height, their weight, their age, and their sex to determine their body fat percentage and their body mass index. It does this by sending a weak electrical current through the body. So we can go ahead and set it up for our patient. So we'll set it at guest. And then her height will do five, six. And then she's 190 pounds. and she is 80 years old. Okay, and she's a female, so we'll change the sex. Okay. okay, so it's all set up. Okay, so I will instruct the patient to hold the sides of the metal here and put their thumbs up, and they're gonna hold it out in front of them like this, and it'll send the electric current through their body, so you can go ahead and 
We'll hit start. So our patient has a body fat percentage of 44.7%. Typical acceptable ranges are anywhere from 20 to 30%, so she is a little bit on the high side. And her BMI is at 30.2, which is very high. The Bruce Protocol Stress Test is the graded exercise stress test used on cardiac patients at SMH to measure their functional capacity. It assesses both the patient's cardiovascular health and their aerobic capacity. Cardiac patients will perform both a pre and a post Bruce Protocol Stress Test to determine if their exercise capacity improved during their time in rehab, which is measured by an improvement in the number of stages reached on the protocol. The Bruce protocol is divided into three minute stages starting at a stage one at 1.7 miles per hour and a 10% incline, stage two at a speed of 2.5 miles per hour and a 12% incline, stage three at 3.4 miles per hour at a 14% incline, and stage four, which is the speed of 4.2 miles per hour and a 16% incline. Before the test begins, the patient should be seated for at least 5 minutes to obtain a resting heart rate, blood pressure, and a baseline reading of the heart's electrical activity to ensure that no abnormal heart arrhythmias are occurring. During each 3 minute stage of the test, one exercise physiologist will record an exercise blood pressure on the patient, while another exercise physiologist will sit behind the EKG monitor and record the patient's heart rate and heart electrical activity. The exercise physiologist administering the patient's Bruce stress test should also ensure to record the patient's cool down blood pressure, their stop time on the test, and the reason for test termination. Some of the most common indications for test termination include reaching the patient's 85% heart rate max, detecting an abnormal heart arrhythmia on the patient's EKG strip, or if the patient is symptomatic or reports angina, claudication, extreme fatigue, or shortness of breath. Finally, after the test is completed, the patient should sit for at least five minutes and have their blood pressure, heart rate, and resting heart rhythm recorded. It is also important to know that for patients with a lower functional capacity, that the modified Bruce protocol stress test is the preferred exercise protocol due to its reduced exercise intensity. Stage one will begin at a speed of 1.7 miles per hour with no incline, and stage two will stay at a speed of 1.7 miles per hour with a 5% incline. And then stage three will correspond to the first stage of the standardized Bruce protocol stress test. Pulmonary patients beginning rehab at SMH are beginning rehab after being diagnosed with a chronic lung disease, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, or pulmonary fibrosis. Depending on their disease diagnosis, they are allotted either 18 or 24 rehab sessions that occur two days a week. The initial evaluation process involves registered respiratory therapists assessing the patient's height, their weight, their BMI, their medical and smoking history, and medica medication usage. It also involves the registered respiratory therapist going over the patient's oxygen use at home, which involves oxygen use during exercise, during daily activities of living, during rest, and during sleep. It also involves the registered respiratory therapist going over the patient's current exercise habits, as well as helping them set exercise goals, such as feeling less short of breath upon exercise. It also goes over the patient's current eating habits and helps them set nutrition goals and psychosocial goals and risk factor goals. Risk factor goals can include how the weather affects their breathing and how often they use a rescue inhaler. 
After the pulmonary patient's initial evaluation session, the registered respiratory therapist will send the patient home with a packet of surveys. The first three surveys are the same as the cardiac patient surveys, which assesses their emotional health, the patient's quality of life, and their nutrition habits. The last two surveys are different between pulmonary and cardiac patients, and that pulmonary patients will complete a shortness of breath questionnaire which has them rate the level of breathlessness that they experience when performing or if they were to perform certain tasks, such as walking up a flight of stairs, mowing the lawn, dressing, brushing their teeth, etc. And the COPD assessment questionnaire measures the impact that the patient's pulmonary disease is having on their daily life and is shown in this picture here to the left. On the pulmonary patient's final rehab session, they will be given a discharge sheet as shown with the front and back, and it's very similar to the cardiac one that I explained earlier. The only major difference is that the pulmonary patients have a walk test outcome on their sheet, which is determined by the distance walked on their six minute walk test, and we hope to see an improvement in this. We also have the disease assessment score and the shortness of breath score that is assessed by the patient's pre and post surveys. Okay, so shown here is how we record the patient's results from the 6-minute walk test, which is the graded exercise stress test used on pulmonary patients at SMH to assess their functional capacity. It's preferred over other stress test protocols due to its success in assessing both a patient's aerobic capacity and their endurance who experience some sort of limitation that reduces their exercise capacity. Patients will perform a pre- and a post-6-minute walk test to determine if their functional capacity improved during their time in rehab. Measurements taken before, during, and after the six-minute walk test include oxygen saturation, heart rate, dyspnea, also known as shortness of breath, and blood pressure. We will also record if the patient stopped or paused before the six minutes, their total distance walked in feet, and whether they use supplemental oxygen. Okay, so shown here is a Borg scale ranging from 0 to 10 that helps patients rank their shortness of breath levels during the 6-minute walk test. Okay, so I just put on the pulse ox on my patient's finger so that I can assess their oxygen saturations and heart rate during the 6-minute walk test. This is our starting point on our path. So right now she's at a 95% oxygen saturation. And this is our walk test path. So I'm gonna instruct her to walk at a brisk pace and I'm gonna walk next to her, making sure that I do not influence her walking speed at all. Okay, so as we pass the water fountains, we're going to end our first lap, turn around, and begin our second lap. It's important during this test to have a piece of scrap paper with you to record the oxygen saturation and heart rate during each lap. And then you will record this on the 6-minute walk test patient sheet. And the highest heart rate that you obtain from all the laps will be used. And then the average of all the oxygen saturations of all the laps will be used. So as you can see here, her oxygen saturation and heart rate are staying pretty steady, which is a good sign. There's no need for us to stop the test prematurely or anything, so we would go ahead and let her continue for the rest of the duration of the test. Now, if her oxygen saturation fell below 88%, we would stop the test and have her use supplemental oxygen because healthy oxygen values are 88 to 100%.